All right, we're gonna work on practice exam three now. The um, first thing I want you to do is make sure you have it printed out so you can follow along, not just kind of watch it and think you understand it. That never ever works. Make sure you print it out. Um, all right, the next thing we're gonna do is every time you get an exam, especially one that has to do with electron configuration, make sure you get your periodic table. Let's go ahead and go through how we're gonna do this. So first step um, to preparing my periodic table is I like to move helium over here. And then I get rid of this. That's because these guys belong in the S block. So now let's go ahead and label our blocks. We label this S. Over here is P. D. Down here is F. And then we look at the rows. We, we first start with S. We label that 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. Then we move on to the P. For the S, we start it with 1. So the P, we start with 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, seven. P we start with two, D we are going to start with three, three, four, five, six, D we start with three, F we're going to start with four, and then five. All right, once we have that done, um, we want to make sure we, we outline our exceptions, just so we don't forget in case they happen to come up. So chromium and molybdenum are our exceptions, and copper, silver, and gold are going to be exceptions from standard electron configuration. Okay, once we have that, we're ready to go ahead and start our exam. So the first question is, <clears throat> for hydrogen, what is the wavelength of a photon emitted as it drops from a 3D orbital to a 1S orbital? So, go ahead and take some paper over here because I probably go over what I provided for myself. So essentially you have this, uh, this atom and I'm just going to draw it as circles, even though a d orbital, we don't even know what kind of d orbital it is. Um, it, it says it's, it's going to be dropping from 3d, so that means from the third level, n equals 3, the first level, where n equals 1. And so there's a few things you should be asking yourself. One, what's going to happen here when an electron drops from any level? you're going to have a photon that's emitted, so you get some kind of light. The next thing you should already know is what kind of light it's gonna be. You can already estimate what the wavelength is gonna be. N equals one, if you remember, is going to be UV light. Actually, let's do this, yeah. N, and then we'll do, I'll make a little table here. So if it falls to N equals one, that's UV. If it falls to N equals two, that's visible. And if it falls to N equals three, that's infrared. Actually, anywhere between 3 and 5 is going to be infrared. There's, there's near, far, and um, standard infrared. Okay, so it's going to fall to n equals 1. I already know it's UV light. You also should already have an idea of the, what those wavelengths should be. Visible was around 400 to 700. IR is going to be greater than 700. And UV is going to be less than 400. So looking at this, <clears throat> we should be able to eliminate a lot of uh, multiple choice answers on a test because we know that UV light's gonna be less than 400, so this should be less than 400 simply because of this N equals one. All right, once we have that information, let's go ahead and solve this thing. We use our standard, our big equation, as I like to call it, where we have delta E of the atom is equal to the energy of a photon which is equal to h nu, which is equal to h c over lambda, because nu equals c over lambda, which is equal to negative 2.18 times 10 to the negative 18 joules times 1 over n final squared minus 1 over n initial squared. Now this is uh, an equation for absorption. So you can use the same equation for emission as we have, but we'll get a negative wavelength. Just take the absolute value of it. It's not a big deal. You can memorize a whole different equation which flips this around, moves this over here and that over there, moves that over there, and that's called the Rydberg equation. Or you can just stick with the standard equation and if you get a negative wavelength, make it positive. All right, so let's go ahead and solve. We have the information that's been given to us has the end values, one and three. In addition, it's asking for the wavelength. So we say, what part of this equation do we need? We need the one with the wavelength and the one with the, the end values. 
So now our equation is just hc over lambda equals negative 2.18 times 10 to the negative 18 joules times 1 over n final squared minus 1 over n initial squared. Now if we start plugging this in, h is 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 joules times 3.00 times 10 to the 8 meters per second over some lambda. And we set that equal to negative 2.18 times 10 to the negative 18 joules times 1 over n final squared. If you remember, we fell. We went from 3 to 1. So our final is 1 over 1 squared minus our initial, which is 1 over 3 squared. So you calculate this out. Uh, you're going to want to move, you're going to want to essentially move the lambda over here. And once you have this calculated, you move that over here. And then you solve for, for lambda. You'll find out that lambda equals 1.026 times 10 to the negative 7 meters. But the questions are normally given in nanometers um, because that's a, that's a easier visualization for, for a lot of us. And they're 10 to the negative 9 meters in a nanometer. So you'll end up with an answer of 103 nanometers, or 102.6. So 103 nanometers should be your final answer. All right, let's look at the next question. It says, which has the largest radius between phosphide, sulfide, chloride, and potassium ion? So we should be paying attention to the, uh, the endings. Um, phosphide ion, we're talking about something that actually has a, uh, a charge. So we go over here. Phosphide has a 3 minus charge. Sulfide has a 2 minus charge. Chloride has a 1 minus charge. We skipped over argon and we went straight to potassium ion. So let's go ahead and draw these out real quick. If you remember, the general trend is that as things go, let me put it this way, down and to the left, they get larger. But that's only for neutral atoms. And it's not neutral, it's talking about ions. So it says, what's the largest radius between phosphide, sulfide, chloride, and potassium? Then you have to look at the, radi at the, uh, excuse me, at the number of protons. So phosphide, sulfide, chloride, and potassium all have the same number of electrons. Phosphide is a P3 minus, which means it has 18 electrons. Sulfide is S2 minus, meaning it has 18 electrons. Chloride, Cl negative, it has 18. And potassium has lost an electron, so it also has 18. So we're looking at P, S, Cl, and K. This is a 3 minus, 2 minus, 1 minus positive. They all have 18 electrons. But the only place that they differ is in the number of protons that they have. Again, we can't follow the trend because they're not neutral. So if we look at the number of protons, phosphide has 15, because it's number 15 on the periodic table. Sulfide has 16, chloride has 17, potassium has 19. Now if you remember, what determines the radius size is how close electrons are to the center. So you ask yourself, here you have 18 electrons at all of them. But this one has more protons pulling it in. This is a stronger pull to the center. If it has a stronger pull to the center, in other words, it has a higher C effective charge, meaning this one is going to be smaller. More protons. Protons pull more electrons to the center. So if you get pulled into the center, it makes you smaller. So it is the smallest. But the question was, which one's the biggest? The opposite effect will be over here. This one isn't pulling as much, so those electrons aren't as close to the center. So this one is going to be the largest. And the question, which has a, let's see. Where'd it go? I guess I didn't write the answer over here. This was 103 nanometers. Which has the largest radius? That's gonna be the P3 minus ion. 
All right, give the ground state electron configuration for Mercury 2. For Mercury 2. If we go over here, Mercury is right there. But it's asking for a Mercury 2 ion, meaning we're going to take away two electrons. So essentially, we're looking right here. Now, if we go to draw the electron configuration, we first find the nearest noble gas. To me, that looks like it's going to be xenon. So on this, we would write xenon. Actually, let's, let's see if we can do this so you can see both the periodic table and... There we go. So our ground state electron configuration will be xenon. The words ground state are just there um, to ensure that you're doing the, the standard electron configuration. Um, there are excited states. We don't get into that at all in Gen Chem, so don't worry. If you see ground state, it's nothing different. It shouldn't be scary. Um, it's nothing new. Okay, so we got, we got xenon here. And then we're going to go through the 6s block. So we go through two electrons in the 6s. If you remember, after we go to 6s, we have to hop down these guys. The f block is attached down here. So we got to go all the way through the 4f, 14. Then we can then we can go back. Oh, did a bad job. There we go. Then we can go back and go through the D block. We're in the 5D. So for plain mercury, it'd be 5D10. Actually, I already did you just service. So once once we have this written out, and I like you to write out the neutral one. This is for mercury. Then you can make sure that you're taking things away from the appropriate. Uh, place. If you remember, um, when we have transition metals, we take away from the S block first. We don't take away from the D, we take away from the S first, and then we move on to the D. That's because the D block is highly stable, and this guy's not as stable. It's easy to take away. It doesn't affect the energy nearly as much. So when we go from, from Mercury to Mercury 2+, plus, essentially all we're going to do is take away from the S block first, and we get an answer of 4F14, 5D10, and that's Mercury 2+. Plus. Number four, give the number of valence electrons for iron. Well, you, you have two options. Is iron um, transition metal? My dog's growling. Is it a transition metal? If it's a transition metal, then you include the D block. If it's not, you don't. So iron is a transition metal, so we've got to include the D block. If you go from here to here, essentially we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight electrons. And it's that simple. We count it all the way. Again, that's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And it has eight valence electrons. That iron does. If it had been outside, so for example, let's go ahead and say it was indium. That's not a transition metal. That's not in the D block. We just count one, two. We skip the D block and go over here. So one, two, three would be what indium has. Place the following in order of increasing ionization energy. Now, kind of opposite to size are general ionization energy trends. So as we go up into the right, we... Um, Things have a higher ionization energy. Fluorine has really, really, really high ionization energy. And that's no surprise then that, that the highest one here will be fluorine, then bromine and sulfur, uh, fluorine, bromine, and, or fluorine, sulfur, and bromine. I can do it. But we should talk about why. Let's look at where fluorine is. It's right here. This is going to be the, the highest. Then we have sulfur. And bromine. So kind of going up into the right, fluorine is first, then sulfur is closer to fluorine, and then bromine is a little bit farther away from fluorine. So when you get to some of these, you can just kind of look for the trends and see which one's closer or which one's not. So fluorine, sulfur, bromine. Then we get to this next one. Lithium, beryllium, and boron. I added this. It's not in your written one, but 
I thought this was a really good one to go through. So here we have lithium, beryllium, and boron. Um, you'd want to say, hey, it's lithium, then beryllium, then boron. Great, there were, with boron being the, the highest ionization energy. And you'd actually be wrong. And that's because if you remember in this third row, boron, This would be like the electron configuration for boron, excluding um, the 1s. Boron is like this, and it easily gives off this electron because it wants to be down and very close to beryllium. So boron will give off an electron very, very easily. So it's going to, if it, had, it gives off easily, it has a low ionization energy. So it's actually slightly lower than beryllium. So over here, our order will be lithium first. Actually, let me, yeah, I can go it this way. Lithium is the least, followed by boron, followed by beryllium. Again, because beryllium gives us off. Boron, which would just be the 2s, or excuse me, beryllium, which would just be the 2s, does not want to give off one of those electrons. How many photons are in a flash of light that contains 195 kilojoules of energy if the wavelength is 425 nanometers? I see 425 nanometers and I think 425 times 10 to the negative 9 meters. I see 195 kilojoules and I see 195 times 10 to the third joules. Okay, so this question is asking how many photons are in a flash of light. So you, it's, it's saying, hey, you have a flash of light that's got a lot of photons in it. And it wants to know how many are in there. Well, if we can, we know that all of them add up to 195 times 10 to the third joules. All of them have that energy. If we can figure out what one of them is, one single one is, then we can figure out how many they all, the, how many there must be to add up to 195 times 10 to the third joules. So let's go ahead and do that. We can use our master equation, which is delta E atom equals E photon. Hey, that's what we're interested in. The energy of a single photon equals HC or H nu, which equals HC over lambda. And we, we can stop right there because we've already gotten enough information because we have wavelength and energy of the photon. These are the two parts that we're looking at. So the energy of a photon should always be less than 2.18 times 10 to the negative 18. It should always be less than 2.18 times 10 to the negative 18. So we, we should know that energy of a photon should come out to like 10 to the negative 19 maybe, 10 to the negative 20, 10 to the negative 21. So be thinking about the what this answer already should be. So we can make sure that we get the right one. Now we're setting it equal to hc over lambda. h is 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34 joules times seconds times 3.00 times 10 to the 8 meters per second, so our seconds cancel, all divided by 425 times 10 to the negative 9. Make sure you put parentheses out around there, meters. If you go through and you solve for this, you'll find out that you get an answer of 4.677 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. And that's how much energy a single photon has in a flash of light that's 425 nanometers. And the question isn't how much energy does one have? The question is how much energy or how many photons in total? Well, if one of them gives off this tiny little amount and you ended up with that much energy, there must be a ton of these. And you can figure it out and you can go back to um, the chapter seven lecture if you wanna know exactly why. We can take 195 times 10 to the third joules, divide it by, 4.677 times 10 to the negative 19 joules. And you'll find out that there is almost a mole of them. 4.17 times 10 to the 23rd photons. So a few things to think about in this, in this problem. One, I look at this and I'm automatically thinking visible light. Doesn't matter. Doesn't end up coming into play. But 
maybe you can start relating visible light to 10 to the negative 19 joules, which would be about the energy of a single photon there. And then we end up getting a lot of photons should be your answer. If you get something that's times 10 to the negative something, that it wouldn't make sense. You need at least one photon. And so be careful with that. And you should be able to already start guessing your answers. Okay, the next question is, is the zinc ion dia or paramagnetic? Well, first let's look at neutral zinc. Neutral zinc's right here. Its electron configuration is argon. Then it looks to me like it's 4s2, 3d10. And that's for neutral zinc. But the question's about the zinc ion. Zinc loses two electrons. Zinc becomes a two plus. So where is it going to lose those electrons from? Hopefully by now we're getting comfortable with the fact that it's gonna be from the s orbital. And so it's gonna be argon. 3d10 and if we drew out these these valence electrons here there are ten of them so we'd say one two three four five six seven eight nine ten and then you ask yourself hey are there any unpaired electrons if there aren't then that magnetism died and it's dia magnetic All right, number eight. In a single atom, what is the maximum number of electrons that can have a quantum number of n equals three? Now there's math that you can memorize, but I, I like, you know how much I hate having equations and things for you to memorize. So I will go over the equation, but first I wanna talk about the why. So n equals three. Let me show you a few places where n equals three. n equals three here, the three S. n equals three here, the 3p, n equals 3 here, the 3d. Is there a 3f? No, we started at 4. So the, the places where you can have n equals 3 is 3s, 3p, and 3d. Now if you ask yourself how many um, orbitals are in each of these, if you remember s has just one, in fact let's just draw it out, p has three orbitals, d has one, two, three, four, five orbitals, and how many electrons can be in each orbital? Two. And so now we just take those numbers and we double them. So the maximum number of electrons in a 3s is gonna be two, the 3p will be six, and the 3d is 10. If we add these up, two plus six plus 10 equals 18 electrons, and that's the maximum number of electrons that can be n equals three. Now for the equation part, grr, you can just take n squared times two. In other words, three squared times two would give me 18. This comes into play when you have something theoretical. So like, I don't know, n equals seven, where we're talking about stuff that gets into the F, G, H, into the H block. So when you get somewhere here, then you just take seven squared times two, was that 49, 108 something, anyways, you do it. Um, now we're gonna select the, the transition that would emit the shortest wavelength. Shortest wavelength, that means the highest energy. Wavelength and energy are opposite. So when we go to, when we go to look at the high number, high amount of energy, um, you wanna look for things that are, well, let me back up. Let's take a second first and draw this. I think I can do a better job here. Now, if you've read the chapter one summary, you know that falling from one to two is like the biggest fall, and then they get smaller and closer together as they go. Maybe this would have been a better way to do it. So as electrons fall, the fall from two to one is bigger than the fall from three to two and the fall from four to and five and six. So when you see short wavelength, I want you to think high energy. Wavelength and energy are inversely proportional. It's because C equals lambda nu and nu is related to the frequency. So as this goes, or nu is the frequency, nu is related to energy. So as this goes down, this goes up. All right, so we have one that's going from five to two one that's going from four to three, one that's going from three to one, one that's going from three to two, 
The one that's going from six to three. Which one would make the largest noise? If you're dropping a rock, which one would have the largest amount of energy? Which one would you not want to get hit by if you're dropping a rock? The one with the biggest jump, right? And from three to one is the biggest jump, and that's why this has the highest energy. It's just, it's just like particles. If you're dropping a rock, um, this one would let off the most sound versus any of these other little tiny things. The important thing to remember is that you're going, that you've got these big jumps. From one to two is the biggest, then it gets subsequently smaller. All right, a hydrogen atom absorbs a photon of UV light. UV light, you automatically be thinking N equals one. And its electron enters the N equals three level. So we're absorbing. So we're going from one, we'll use up here. We're going from one to three. So it absorbed UV light. Estimate its wavelength and then calculate it. Um, all right, so we can estimate its wavelength if it's UV light we automatically ought to be thinking UV light is going to be less than 400 nanometers. And you could you could look up why that is at the beginning of the video. You've actually already seen it, so just rewind it if you need to know. Um, UV light is less than 400. So that eliminates questions on an exam already. The next question is um, to calculate it. So let's figure out exactly what it is so we have an idea. If we look at our, at our long equation, in fact, I think I have it right here. If we looked at a long equation here, it gives us information about um, n and is asking about wavelength. So we're talking about the wavelength portion and the n portion. So we can simply say hc over lambda equals negative 2.18 times 10 to the negative 18 joules times 1 over n final squared. Well, it absorbed. So now we're talking about the final being the three minus one over n initial squared. We're talking about the initial being one. You know h is 6.626 times 10 to the negative 34. You know c is three times 10 to the eighth. And you will find out that you get an answer for wavelength of 103 times 10 to the negative seven meters, which equals 103 nanometers and that should make sense because that's less than 400 nanometers. This is actually the same problem just kind of working backwards as was one of the other ones we did, one of the first ones we did. So all right y'all hopefully that helped at least a little bit and you're able to do these and if you're not then rewind and do them again and again and again and again until you knock them out of the park because I guarantee this kind of stuff is going to show up. All right have a great one. Bye.